We talked about RSA very briefly, for less than a minute that is, in the last video. And what we're going to do here is take an illustrated look at the entire process. You know, where the public keys go, where the private keys go or don't go, and the role that the certificate server plays in this entire process. And we've brought our old friends Bob and Dan back from previous videos. They're looking a little better now. They've been upgraded. And we're going to start this process from the very beginning with Bob and Dan both having a key pair, which is a clever little name for our private key and our public key. And the public key can be seen by everyone and the private key by no one. Well, no one except the possessor of the actual key. Now, Bob and Dan aren't going to just start trying to authenticate each other immediately in this particular process. What we're going to do is bring in this device called a certificate server, which in this case is our certificate authority, our CA. And that, of course, is going to be made up of one or more certificate servers. But it's the CA we're talking to. And what's going to happen at the beginning of this process is that both Bob and Dan are going to do what we call enrolling. They're going to enroll with the certificate authority and they're going to send the CA some information. And that information includes their public keys, their IP address, and their name. Now I put name on this particular screen. It's a little bit longer than that. Uh, it's actually a fully qualified domain name, FQDN. And the, the reason we use fully qualified domain names is that it removes any ambiguity from who exactly we're talking about. Because if you're saying, I want to, uh, my name is Fred, and I would like to, you know, get a secure certificate from you, a digital certificate. Well, there are many Freds in the world. And you could say, you know, my name is Fred Stark, my name is Chris Bryant, my name is whatever. And still, it's going to be, you know, the situation where, well, there are a lot of people with that name. Well, what if I said I was Chris Brand and here's my address and here's my phone number and here's my blood type and everything else? Well, then you could narrow it down and there would be no ambiguity. And I mentioned blood type because sometimes when you're trying to register your website with a certificate authority, that's what you think it's going to come down to sooner or later. And we will talk about that here shortly. Uh, but as far as the fully qualified domain name goes, this absolutely removes ambiguity from who we're talking about uh, because what you do, you have the device name, followed by the parent domain name here on Wikipedia. They give my myhost.example.com. That would be the FQDN if the local host was called, excuse me, local host, yes, was called my host, and your domain name was example.com because, as they mentioned, you can have many hosts in the world called my host, but only one myhost.example.com. So that is the name that we are sending in this particular situation. Now, if all goes well, and in this example it does, You'll notice this time the certificate authority is sending Bob and Dan something. And what it's sending them is a digital certificate. Now it's issuing digital certificates to both Bob and Dan. This is networking, so we got to have multiple names for it. Digital certificates are also known as identity certificates and public key certificates. And I see that says identify certificates, but I'll change that to identity. Uh, the digital certificate states fundamentally this person owns this particular public key because I say so. That's really what the CA is, is saying. Uh, this certificate is also going to contain some other information. It's going to contain some PKI related information and we're going to go through that process in uh, the next section of the course actually, everything that's going on there. Uh, it's also going to have the URL of a revocation list. And we'll talk about what exactly that revocation list is and why it exists because you can hear the name of it, revocation list. It's like, well, something's been taken away. Uh, it's going to have some other information, but fundamentally uh, what the CA is saying is this person owns this particular public key and this is who they are. Because sooner or later, and it sounds like a song lyric, but sooner or later it all comes back to trust. You have to trust somebody in this entire process or none of us are going to be able to talk securely to none of us, <laughs> right? Um, so instead of trying to keep some massive trusted list of devices that you and I own and every network owns and etc., uh, that's uh, what we would call a non-scalable solution. What we're going to have instead is a list of certificate authorities and a lot of web browsers, for example, and I'll actually show you that shortly, uh, a lot of web browsers actually have a list of certificate authorities that they pre-trust. 
they say if this comes from, you know, GoDaddy or Starfield or this one or that one or that CA, then we're going to go ahead and trust them. It's not something that we have to put in um, manually. Now, the private keys, a couple of notes here, the private keys are going to remain private in this entire process. They're not going anywhere. They're going to get involved here pretty shortly uh, as far as the authentication goes. And also, these digital certificates are not valid forever. Just because you get a certificate, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to trust you forever and ever. They have validity dates. And also, uh, going back to that revocation list I mentioned a moment ago, uh, if you screw up <laughs> according to their rules, uh, the CA can say, you know what, we told you not to do that, and you did that, and we're pulling your CA. You know, you could be distributing something they don't want you to distribute. You could be using the certificate for purposes that they don't want you to use it for. And they have the right to just yank that from you uh, at any time. Now, as far as the certificate authority goes, you can, in larger and in smaller ones, but it would be more, uh, more sensible to have this in a larger one, you can have your own certificate authority. You can create one. And not to, not to make fun of it, you know, you call it, SAM Certificate Authority. And it could be the Certificate Authority for your company, but because of that pre-trusted list of CAs that we have with web browsers, you would then have to let your company's web browsers know, you know, hey, you should also trust this particular Certificate Authority. And of course, if you have a corporate CA, the certificates that it issues would not make would not be valid for any communications outside the network. Those computers would just look at it and say, I don't know who the heck this is and I don't trust them. And then you get messages on the screen uh, and all kinds of stuff. So again, the digital certificates are going to go back to Bob and Dan in this situation. They're known as identity certificates and public key certificates. And at that point, once these two devices have their digital certificates, then the process of Bob and Dan chatting securely with each other can actually go on to the authentication process. They haven't really authenticated yet. Now, there's another signature involved here, and it's actually on these certificates that the CA sent back to both Bob and Dan. And that is the CA's signature, because it makes sense that if a certificate authority says, you know, yes, this is Sam, and this is his FQDN, and this is his IP address, this is his name, this is him, um, then there's got to be a signature, right? Because really, you know what these really are? They're really contracts. You know, you are, you are saying it's almost like being a notary public, actually. Really, you just stamp and you say, you know, I affix my seal to this. And that's really what the signature is for that CA. It's affixing a signature to it saying, yes, I am saying this person is who they are. And that particular signature is, uh, it's going to be verified using the CA's public key. So there's a lot of verification. Those of you who have taken courses from me before say that I always say, you know, trust but verify. Well, there's a little bit of trusting going on here <laughs> and a lot of verifying. Uh, but in today's world, it's absolutely necessary. So let's just walk through this process again very quickly. Was, <clears throat> pardon me. At the very beginning, this is where we are. And then Bob and Dan are going to send their public key, their FQDN, and their IP address to the CA. They're enrolling with the CA. If the CA likes what it sees, it will issue digital certificates back to Bob and Dan, and that's going to have some PKI-related info. It's going to give them the URL of the revocation list uh, and some other information. And this is where we're in pretty good shape as far as Bob and Dan being able to talk to each other securely. We're not quite there yet, though, because now they're going to start exchanging their digital certificates, and we're going to move forward to authentication. We're going to cover that situation when we come back in the very next video. So I'll see you there.